Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan, and I'm a technology evangelist at Microsoft. In this session, I want to build on top of some of the topics that you may have already covered. And I want to broadly think about the implications of artificial intelligence. Let's begin. Now, it's no secret, the world is changing. This brings with it challenges, but also the opportunities to be able to reimagine the world of tomorrow. It's a time for us to look towards technology and think about how we might be able to do things differently, how we might be able to do things better. But to understand where we are, we need to take a step back. We need to understand where we've been. Now, what better way to do this than to go back to the very beginning? You see, artificial intelligence has become powerful, and it's become powerful because it's able to learn from the data around it. But if we stop and think about it, isn't that how humans have become powerful too? Take our hunter-gatherer ancestors, for example. They only survive because they learn to read the world around them. Weather patterns, herd migration, season changes, and the benefits of fire. They were surrounded by data, and they put it to great use. It's no different today. We still collect and share data, but as the volume grows, we've learned to build tools that better understand, identify, and respond to its potential. We call these algorithms. Now, our digital lives are governed by them. When we use social media, when we stream a film, plan a trip, and shop online, Algorithms are working behind the scenes to move the process along. Think about when you search on the internet. That's an algorithm that determines the results or perhaps the news feed of your favorite social media platform. Algorithms look at your friends, your mutual friends, and your interests and purchase preferences before using that data to customize a feed that's presented back to you. Ironically, the information we provide fuels the information that we receive. But how does AI learn? Do machines really think? Can they think? Well, to answer this, we need to consider the question. What is intelligence? For artificial intelligence, we consider this to be the following five attributes. Learning, reasoning, problem solving, perception, and language. Let's look at these in more detail. Now, currently, Computers learn through supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement-based methods. We'll start with supervised, and as you can probably guess, it means someone looking over the shoulder of the CPU and judging whether the computer is getting things right. It means having a full set of labeled data while training the algorithm. This way of teaching means that each example that we present is tagged with the right answer. So the machine can learn through association and repetition. It's like teaching a child to read with phonic cards. Now, you're probably thinking, wait, hold on. We, we don't hold up flashcards to a computer. But the thing is, we kind of do. Think about those apps that can identify objects. You know, this is a car, this is a bike, this is a person. Well, the computer only knows this because somebody has painstakingly gone through the images telling the computer, this is a car, this is a bike, this is a person. But what happens when we don't have perfectly labeled data sets or we ask questions that haven't been trained? This type of learning is called unsupervised. With this model, the machine is given the data with no explicit instructions or even an example of the the desired outcome is simply asked to try and find some kind of pattern. This means that the system can organize data in many ways. This could be through matching colors, shapes, or sizes, or perhaps anomaly detection, whereby it detects something unusual. Think about how your bank checks for fraudulent activity or how sometimes your card won't work when you're abroad. This is down to a machine thinking that something isn't quite right. This brings us to our last example, reinforcement-based learning. Now, this training is based on two aspects, discovery of what's not known and exploitation of what is. 
Think of it like playing a video game. How many times have you tried to complete a level only to run into an enemy or some other thing that cuts the game short? Through trial and error, patience and practice, you eventually figure out a way to beat the level and complete the game. This is the very essence of reinforcement-based learning. Now, unfortunately, what historically comes with technological disruption is fear. And today, many people worry about artificial intelligence taking everyone's job. But again, if we look to our past, we can see that changes happened before. And although people were nervous at the time, the change was ultimately for the better. Go back to the 18th century as Britain began the Industrial Revolution. At the time, people were freaking out. Papers printed headlines such as, the march of the machine makes idle hands. But what actually happened was an explosion in economic growth. It changed how, when and where people worked. It inspired innovation and it accelerated production. In short, it made humanity step up its game and we're still enjoying the benefits of it even today. The fact is almost everything that we use, consume, wear and take for granted is a byproduct of the industrial revolution. By embracing the change, we've reaped the rewards. Today, hospitals use machine learning to help doctors diagnose illnesses more quickly. In fact, artificial intelligence is now more accurate at diagnosing breast cancer through mammograms than its human counterparts. This makes the screening more accurate. It produces better outcomes and ultimately serves to reduce the stress of the patient. But AI also raises questions of ethics, with some people asking that just because we can, does that mean we should? And opinions are divided. Like any change, people will discuss the pros and cons, the risk and opportunity. What's important is that when we build AI, we build it to be fair. It must also be inclusive, transparent, accountable, and safe. We must make sure that these principles are firmly rooted in the design so that they have a positive impact. So where does this leave us? Now, I can't tell you what new jobs will emerge, but what I can say is that I think AI will have a massive influence on them. Banks will need data engineers, retailers will need data scientists. Even farmers will need technology to help them better grow their crops. What this means is that we need to train and nurture the workforce of tomorrow. We need to improve the careers advice that's provided. We need to remove the stereotypes and we need to encourage more women into the field. If we can do this, then we build a pipeline and we ensure that we have enough talent to meet future demands. Okay, so let's change pace and show off some of the ways in which AI is improving our lives. I'll begin with the immersive reader. Now, 10% of the world's population suffer with some form of dyslexia. This causes problems with reading, writing, and spelling. And this isn't any reflection on intelligence. Dyslexia is a lifelong problem that can present challenges on a daily basis. But support from tools such as the Immersive Reader help those with the problem be successful at both school and work. You can change themes, fonts, spacing and size. You can break down syllables, highlight nouns, verbs, objectives and adverbs. You can add picture dictionaries, change focus points and translate into different languages, meaning that we can break down borders and give a voice to all. But what about business? Products such as Q&A Maker are empowering them to quickly create chatbots with nothing more than answering a few simple questions. By quickly converting the content into simple question and answer sets, we can create conversational AI in minutes, supporting rich text, images and links. This is the realization of consumer-based AI. It's not just for large corporate entities, but it's an enrichment tool for all. Now, I want to show you something. This is a Microsoft HoloLens. It's an untethered mixed reality headset that blends the physical and digital worlds together. 
By using spatial mapping through powerful sensors, it, it maps the environment around you and projects holographic images into your peripheral vision. It does this with a depth camera and four different light sources, along with long throw laser mapping and short throw illumination. Together, these equip the device to quickly understand human interaction and gesture control. Let's take a look. Look at this painting I brought. It's the Piazza Navona, a place where Roman artists have gathered for centuries. Ciao is how you say hi in Italian. Go ahead, give it a try. Ciao. Perfect. You'd fit right in. In fact, rather than just staring at this painting, let's go see Rome in real life. Feast your eyes. We're actually standing in Piazza Navona in Rome, a city that's been home to emperors and artists, popes and gladiators, and, as you can see, lots and lots of tourists. Now, I realize that not everybody is lucky enough to own a HoloLens, but we do all have this type of technology available to us today. Seeing AI is an intelligent camera app that can provide you with information on who and what is around you. And this is particularly useful for somebody with a visual impairment. By simply holding up your phone, you'll hear an audio description of documents, people, scenes, products, color, light, and handwriting. Let's take a look. Scene preview. Processing. A laptop computer sitting on top of a table. Product. Processing. Heinz Vegetable Soup 400G. Handwriting Preview. Processing. I can read this. Person. One face near center, less than a meter, processing. 38-year-old man wearing glasses looking happy. So there you have it. A handful of cool demos that highlight where we're heading and ones that you can pick up and use today. But let's go further. Let's build an end-to-end -end solution from scratch and bring together the power of cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and the internet of things so that we can help solve a real world issue. Now, if you wanna follow along, you'll need access to an Azure subscription, which you can get for free by following the link on the screen. I'll also include a link to the step-by-step -step instructions on my website, along with any files that you may need. So sit down, get comfortable, and we'll begin. So in this scenario, we're going to imagine that we're a group of scientists and we're trying to monitor the dwindling polar bear population of the Arctic. As such, we will pretend that we have placed hundreds of motion activated IoT cameras at strategic locations throughout the region and then use artificial intelligence to automate the process of looking at the captured images and plotting on a map when a polar bear has been spotted. So the first thing that we want to do is build our storage account. This is nothing more than a drive hosted in Azure that will enable us to store the images generated from the cameras. To do this, I'm going to open up a cloud shell and run some simple commands. Now it's worth noting that you don't have to use a command line. Cloud services will allow you to use a graphical interface, but as you progress, you'll often find that it can actually sometimes be easier doing it from a command line and shell. So let's build our resource group, which is nothing more than a space to store the other assets that we're about to create. Think of it like a folder for your documents. As you can see, the command is pretty simple. I'm just stating that I want to create a new resource group and that I would like to call it PBEARS and place it in a Central American data center. Next, 
I will create a variable for my account name and I will call this pbear photos. Now, a variable is used to store information that we can reference at a later stage. This is super useful when we're using the command line or writing programs because it means that we can call the variable at any time and know that the context is correct. Look at how I use it here when I create my storage account. I simply call my variable and place it into my new resource group. Finally, I will create a folder from within the storage account. Let's call it Photos. With that created, all I need to do now is retrieve the access key and store it in a safe place. I want you to think of an access key as a password and the credentials that we will need to use that will enable us to access our new storage account. And the next thing that I'm going to do is simulate the cameras. Obviously, I don't really have a bunch of IoT devices in the Arctic, but with the power of code, it's pretty simple to pretend that we do. To do this, I'm going to use Node.js, a JavaScript runtime that can be used to build fast and simple applications. To begin with, I'll check the version that I'm running, and as we can see, it's version 12.17. Next. I'll install the Azure storage interface so that it can access the folder that we've created previously. You'll see that I've downloaded a whole bunch of images that we can use for this demo. I also have a couple of files needed to simulate the cameras and upload the images into the photo location. Again, don't worry if you're following along. I've put everything that you'll need into a zip file and hosted it on my website. You just need to download them. What we do need to do though, is set the storage account name and the storage account key. Fortunately, we can do this again with another simple variable. Finally, I will run the run.js script, which will simulate the images captured from the cameras. As you can see, the cameras begin to work, which means that we can now move on and train artificial intelligence to recognize the images captured. Now we're going to use Azure Cognitive Services. This is a, a suite of more than 20 services and APIs backed by machine learning that enables developers to incorporate intelligent features such as facial recognition and sentiment analysis into their applications. Custom Vision Service is the one that we'll be using today. And this enables us to create image classification models that learn from labeled images. And if you cast your minds back, this is what we called supervised learning. So let's begin by building a custom service model. To do this, I will create a new project. I'll call the project Polar Bear Vision and then click on Create New next to Resource. I'm going to name my new resource Polar Bear Vision and ensure that it's placed into the resource group that we created earlier. I'm also going to check the location and the pricing of the model. Next, I will amend my project name for clarity, add a description and point to the storage account created previously. Now I want this to be a classification based project and I will only place a single tag on each image. This should make it nice and easy to train. From here, we can begin to add the images. So let's begin with adding some Arctic foxes. As you can see, all I need to do is select the photos and add the tag before they upload into the training set. Let's now repeat these steps for polar bears. Finally, we'll repeat the process again for the walrus. With our images uploaded, we can train our model. I'll select quick as our data set isn't very complex. So let's now run a quick test and see how well our model performs. I'll begin with the Arctic Fox. And as you can see, the probability of 100 is returned. Next, we will look at Polar Bear, which again scores well. 
Finally, we will look at the Warus, which again scores top marks. So great, let's publish our model, grab the URL and access key so that we can connect to it later. Now, the next thing that we want to do is run an Azure function. These allow us to run small pieces of code without having to worry about running a computer or virtual machine. And more often than not, these are referred to as serverless computing. They're triggered by a specific type of event, which in our case will be when a new image is captured by our IoT cameras. So from the Azure graphical interface, let me navigate into our resource group. Now, I'm going to be using this lots, so let me save time by pinning it onto my dashboard. You can see that we're able to change the format and layout of the dashboards and customize it to taste. Now, I'm a neat freak, so I will reduce the resource group to a more manageable size. Okay, with that, let's add some new services from the Azure Marketplace. From here, I'm simply going to search for an Azure function and then select the service from the list of results. I'll ensure that I'm creating the service in the resource group that we created and give it a unique name as it's based on the internet naming conventions of DNS. I'll select Node.js as the runtime and ensure that the service is in the Central American data center before pointing it to the storage account that we created earlier in the exercise. With that done, I will press the Create button and wait for the service to build. Now, this won't take long, and when it completes, we can go ahead and access the new resource. From here, I want to create a new function, and I want this to have access to the Azure Storage account that we created before. I'll give it a name, update the path, and select the storage account before pressing OK. Now we will need to take note of these as they're needed in a later step, but when done, we can go ahead and press Create. Next, we want to update the code. This is going to call the custom vision service and then pass the URL of the image to be analyzed from our storage account and into the function so that we can pass the results. This will be used to indicate the probability of the image containing a polar bear. We need to replace the connection string with the one that we previously recorded, but once done, we can go ahead and save our function. From here, we'll connect into a console and add the Azure Storage Connector. Please ignore any warning messages. You know, we're using an older version of JavaScript, so these are to be expected. So the next thing that we want to do is add two application settings. These will be the prediction URL and the prediction key. If you recall, these were retrieved when we built our custom vision service. So let's save the changes and head back into the function. So I'm gonna open up the log service from under the code and test tools. What I want to see here is information returned when I run the node.js script, and that's simulating the cameras. As you can see, the information is coming through, which means that we have now created a fully functioning service that transmits wildlife photos to online storage and then uses artificial intelligence to, to classify the images. I mean, how awesome is that? But we don't want to stop there. We want to make this visual. We want to be able to see the results on a rich graphical map, not a boring log. So let's look at how we can achieve that. So the first thing that we want to do is build ourselves a database. And we're going to use Azure SQL. 
Again, in the modern world, we don't want to have to worry about managing computers or operating systems and packages. So by using Azure SQL, we can let Microsoft worry about everything else and just focus on what we actually care about, our data. Let's add a few variables to define our server, database, username, and password. Next, we will build our cloud server by calling on our variables and placing it into our resource group. Finally, we will build our database, again, using the variables that we just specified. With that done, we will want to go in and open the firewall so that Azure will allow us access to our new service. Now, security is always top of mind. We don't just want anybody getting in, which is why, by default, the service is locked down. Once updated, we will navigate to the database and open the query editor using the credentials that we specified to log in. We're going to build a simple query, and this query will create our table structure. This will allow us to list things like the camera ID, the, the latitude and longitude, in addition to a timestamp and classification of the image. From here, we want to go back and update our function app so that it will begin sending information across to our new database. To do this, we'll head back into the console and install a service that would allow the app to talk to the server. From here, we can add four new variables and update our function code. Again, if you're following along, I'll place everything that you need into a zip file on my site, meaning that all you need to do is paste it into your own build. These statements connect to the database and execute insert commands, and these will record the latest sightings. The row added to the database includes the ID, latitude, longitude, URL of the blob containing the photograph and the current date and time. Finally, it will indicate if the custom vision service has indicated whether the photograph contains a polar bear. Now, before we run our node.js script again, we just want to update our application settings once more. This time, we will add the database username and password. With that done, let's run the script and see what it produces. To do this, I will once again log back into the editor and run a simple query that selects to read from the polar bears table. As you can see, it produces some results, which means that our code is working and we're helping artificial intelligence save the polar bears one click at a time. So let's finish our project with some rich visualization through Power BI. Now, Power BI is a collection of services, apps, and connectors that work together to turn sources of data into visually immersive and interactive insights. This could be a simple Excel spreadsheet or a collection of cloud-based services. Let's begin. So the first thing that I'm going to do is connect to our database. And this is nothing more than selecting Get Data and then entering the name of the server and database that we wish to connect to. From here, I will select Direct Query and add a string that selects the last 20 rows of the database Polar Bears. We're now connected, which means that we can begin building our rich visualizations. I'll start by adding a map and selecting the latitude, longitude, and is polar bear fields. I want to format the latitude and longitude fields so they don't summarize an average. Next, I will create a table that pulls in the camera ID, timestamp, and polar bear detection fields. From here, I'll create a pie chart that lists the latitude and polar bear data points. Now, I want to change the format of latitude to count, as we're looking for numbers of detected bears. Finally, I will use the slicer tool, which is a great way to filter information in my visualizations. 
As you can see, this one will simply have the options true and false to indicate whether a polar bear has been detected. With my data added, we can begin formatting the page. It already looks good, but with a little tweaking, we can make it look so much better. To start, I'll change the visualizations of the map. I'll change the name, data colors, and the map style from road to aerial. Now, this is personal preference. I think it makes it look much more impactful, but please feel free to play around and adjust to taste. Next, I will update the pie chart. I will change the data colors, labels, and title into a format that I like before formatting the table with some minor modifications. Again, adjust the suit. That's a great thing about this tool. You're able to make it your own. So now we get to the end of our build. Let's go ahead and give it a whirl. Let's log into our database and clean up the tables. Now, I want to do this because I want it to run clean so that we can see that the end-to-end -end solution is working. We can do this with a simple delete from query, which should execute instantly. Now let's jump back into our command prompt and run our node.js script one last time. This will take a few minutes, but when we refresh our Power BI report, we should see all of our new data being richly visualized by the tool. And look, that's just what we've got. A report that shows in near real time polar bear activity on the island, highlighting false and positive sightings and filtered through the slicer. We did it. An end to end solution using a whole bunch of cool technology. And there's so much more that you can see and do. Head over to my website where I have a whole bunch of links that will enable you to learn, build, and try artificial intelligence for yourself. Now, it's my hope that this lesson has shown you the immense power of technology and how artificial intelligence will empower us all. This is the future that we dreamed of. This is, this is what happens when we embrace technology and innovate. It empowers us all to achieve more. This in turn enables us to shape the world that we wish to see. Thank you.